Good morning, Gateway. It is so good that you guys have allowed us into your home again for Church at Home. And I know many of you are still tuning in and watching us online. We're glad to be able to continue to do this every week. I do want to remind you, if you're not aware, that as far as in-person gatherings go, uh, we are back to our regular schedule. And so uh, that means there are three hours of activities on Sunday mornings. At 8.15, we have a small group hour. At 9.30, we have a small group hour and a worship service. And then the third hour is at 10.45, and that's our second worship service. And so uh, there are groups that are, are there and being offered for all age groups, just like before. And then also we're continuing that 6.30 p.m. service, uh, mask only. If that works better for you, we'd love for you to join us at that service as well. I would also say there's no need anymore for you to save your seat uh, as long as we can balance out our crowds in those services and uh, stay well distanced, then we're going to be fine there. So uh, if you're ready to come back, I uh, mean, we're, we're ready for you. And so I uh, hope that you'll be able to do that very, very soon. I also want to mention to you that we're getting ready to start up one of our uh, incredible programs at Gateway called Launch. And Launch is the way that we as a church are attempt, uh, intentionally approaching Jesus' command to make disciples. And so if you are interested not only in becoming a, a deeper disciple, a deeper follower of Jesus, but really if you're interested in becoming a disciple maker, Launch is really the place to start. It is a, it is a pretty significant commitment, and we want you to know about that. And so uh, we'd love for you to ask some questions about Launch. There'll be applications available uh, at the Next Steps desk on Sunday and then very soon online. Uh, there's information there. You can read about it, and I hope you'll consider becoming a part of the Launch program at Gateway. Man, what a great thing to do the very thing that Jesus left us on this earth to do. And uh, this is a great way to get involved in that, uh, to learn, to progress in that. So I hope you'll consider that. And then also I want you to be sure and mark a very special date. We're going to have a, another Fort Tipton Day this fall. It's going to be October 25th. And so we're planning some really creative, fun projects. And so uh, we'll be giving more details about that as that gets closer. But go ahead and mark that day, Sunday, October 25th for Fort Tipton Day. Uh, again, so glad that you tuned in today to worship with us. I'm going to pray for us, and then in just a few moments, we're going to worship together, and then we're going to open God's Word, and we're going to let God speak uh, to our hearts today. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity today to be in your presence, to know you, to walk with you, to be loved uh, moment by moment by you, to have been redeemed by you. And Father, I pray today as we sing songs of worship to you that you would be pleased with the attitude of our hearts, Lord, that, uh, that you would see uh, worship that is true, worship that is in spirit, and Father, that in it you would be honored and glorified and praised, and Lord, that our hearts would be right and fixed on you today as you work uh, in us, as you uh, bring grace and mercy to your children today. Father, I pray this morning as we open your word, Lord, that it would be clear, uh, Lord, that you would uh, remove me uh, from your word today and just allow it to speak directly to the hearts of your children and that, Father, you would be honored in that today as well. You'd be honored in our response to what your word and your spirit says to us today. So, Father, we love you. Lord, thank you for a blessed church, blessed body of believers that you've allowed us to be a part of. Lord, thank you for every person today that is watching. Lord, I know there are all kinds of needs, uh, hurts, struggles, uh, just difficulties going on in the lives of folks today. And, Lord, I pray that by the power of your spirit that you would bring hope and healing and grace and encouragement today. Um, and Lord, that in all things, you would be lifted up. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right. Well, you guys gather around and uh, let's sing together and let's worship the Lord. Between us, how high. 
we introduced a new song last week, Goodness of God, and we want to sing it again this week so that we rehearse these truths, we sing them over and over again, these truths and these themes of God, uh, so that they're not just words on our lips, but they move down to our hearts and take root in our lives and help inform our theology and our thinking about who God is. And He is good. been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful faithful and all my life 
you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Any of you guys ever get tired of yourself? You get tired of the way maybe in recent days that you've been responding to people. Maybe the school starting back and maybe the political climate and the quarantine or whatever has put you in a place where you're not so proud of some of the things that you've said and done in recent days. And maybe uh, you've allowed uh, sin and stuff to seep into your life, and maybe you kind of pushed away from the church, isolated yourself uh, from God, and you've now you've, you've left asking yourself, what in the world is wrong with me? Well, the message of the minor prophet that we're going to study today is that there really is only one thing that is wrong, and there's really only one way to get back to where we need to be. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to be in one of the minor prophets today. And let me just say to you that these books are called minor prophets, not because they're unimportant, but because they're short. And uh, I kind of like that. The, the prophet gives his message, he gets in, he gets out, and you've got the whole message very quickly. And you say, well, Brother Steve, why don't you uh, apply that to your sermons from now on? And I would say that's a great idea. And so today we're going to try to quickly look in the book of Joel. And if you have your Bibles, you guys turn with me to the book of Joel. It is the second in the Minor Prophets. I'll give you about an hour to find it because it is a difficult Bible uh, book in your Bible to find. But the Minor Prophets, they describe how life in Israel went so wrong. And they describe how uh, how Israel could come back to God and how they could find uh, restoration, when they were asking questions like, what's wrong with us? And Joel provides answers and it shows how restoration can take place. Now, Joel is actually one of the earliest recorded prophets. Um, it's a little bit confusing because it's, it's uh, so uh, far over in your Old Testament, but really it's an early prophet. It was written uh, after the time of Solomon, uh, Joel was probably a contemporary of Elisha, the prophet, if that helps place it any. But it was written in a time when a lot of things had gone wrong in Israel. They had some bad leaders. They had suffered through a national plague. That's right, a national plague that we're going to talk about here in just a few minutes. Uh, the stock market was down. Foreign trade was low. National confidence was non-existent. Almost everyone in the nation would have believed that the nation was headed in the wrong direction. And Joel here is writing to diagnose the problem. And he's going to tell them that there's really only one problem. See, they think a bunch of things are wrong. They think they need to deal with a lot of different things. And it's so overwhelming when actually it's not. At the root, there's only one thing that's wrong. And, you know, that's true, right, in, in our lives sometimes. Sometimes we look at our lives and we think, man, there are so many things that I need to deal with and so many things that I need to fix and so much stuff going on in my life. But in reality, the message that I want you to hear today is this, that most of the time there's really only one thing that's wrong and there's really only one way back. Now, first of all, I want to tell you about this national plague. Now, it's not a virus, but it is a bug. And I'm going to read some select verses to you. Joel opens his book by describing a locust plague. And so you guys look with me, Joel chapter 1 and verse 4 is where we're going to start. It says, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a locust. We're going to put 
a picture there for you. They're about three inches long and they look like a heavily armored grasshopper, right? A grasshopper tank is what they are. And thankfully, at least in, uh, in our area, we don't experience locust plagues. But that's not always been true. In fact, in 1915 here in the States, there was a locust plague. Observers said one March, swarms of locusts just appeared in the sky. They flew down from the northeast in clouds so thick that they obscured the sun. Immediately, they began to dig holes in the soil about four inches deep and a half inch wide, depositing more than 100 eggs in each hole. These holes were literally everywhere. About 70,000 eggs would be concentrated in a single square yard of soil and these patches covered the ground for miles and miles. Within a few weeks, these young locusts hatched, resembling large ants. They hadn't formed wings yet, and so they hopped along the ground, and they could cover four to 600 feet a day, devouring any vegetation on the ground in their path. Now, this is going to remind you of the verse that I just read in Joel chapter 1. It says, As they grew they developed the ability to jump, at which point their range got higher and they would scour the trees and the vines. A few weeks later, they would develop wings and they'd swarm over the areas they had already devoured to destroy any plant life that was left in it. And again, just a photo of a tree there that's been stripped bare by locusts. The sound of their swarms, they said, was terrifying. Witnesses said that within a few days, There was literally nothing living plant-wise left. They even eat the bark off of the trees, leaving behind a wasteland that looks like a nuclear holocaust. As they get more desperate for food, they swarm into houses, eating food, clothes, fabric, and even wood. Now, Joel here is describing this, and for him, it represents two things. He talks about this as an illustration of the destructiveness of their sin. And guys, there's so many parallels here between the locust plague and sin, right? It starts small, but it grows. It seems harmless, and yet it is never fully satisfied. Uh, From the darkness of the horde, right, to the gradual and ultimate destruction that it causes, uh, Joel here clearly is describing uh, sin. But I think the most clear use of the locust plague here is to give Israel a warning, the warning of a coming judgment, one that would be more terrible than the locusts would bring. And Joel here is saying that unless Israel wakes up, unless they return to God, God is going to send the armies of Babylon into Israel like a horde of locusts. Listen to how Joel prophesies about the Babylonian invasion in terms of this locust plague. Uh, Look at chapter 1 again, uh, verses 5 through 7, and then over into chapter 2. He says, Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made wide. And then over in chapter 2 and verse 2, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountain, a great people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been seen, nor will there ever be such any after them, even for many successive generations." A fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. You can see the the locust plague there. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds so they run with a noise like the chariots. Over the mountains they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble like a strong people set in battle array. I mean, Joel is help, trying to help them see what is coming. Now, there's a huge lesson here. He wanted them to see before it happened what could happen if they did not return 
to Him. Now listen, there's a lesson here. God is always trying to let you see where sin is taking you before it's too late. And here Joel is showing the nation. He shows them in this locust plague, right? And we see this all the time in Scripture. When we experience the painful consequences of our sin before it's too late, like this plague here, that's always God. And it's always Him in mercy and in love trying to wake us up. He's not trying to pay us back for our sins. He's trying to bring us back to Himself. And here, Joel lets them see that if they don't return to Him, hey, this is what could happen, just like this locust plague, that there is coming this kind of judgment on you. And maybe you feel like locusts are eating away at every part of your life. You're trying to save money, but, but God just keeps letting stuff break down, right? You're trying to be better in your marriage, but new issues of conflict just keep coming up that you don't know how to deal with. You keep trying new strategies in your life to be happy, right? But it always feels shallow and empty, and it always ends up not working. And guys, if you're constantly looking for ways to be happy outside of the Lord, God will constantly be trying to wake you up. And last, I want you to know something. God has more locusts than you have solutions. God has more locusts than you have solutions. No new life strategy is going to fix it because there's only one thing that is wrong. It's a vertical problem. It's a problem between us and God. And here he's trying to show this to Israel. Listen, guys, quit looking for worldly solutions to your sin and your problems. In order for God to bring you to your senses, he has to bring you to the end of yourself. And for some of you guys, listen, for some of you, he's been calling you literally for years. The locusts have been feasting in your life day after day, month after month, year after year, but you haven't been ready to listen because you've not yet come to the end of yourself. Because in order for God to make you new, He has to rip out what is old. We should not be surprised if our world keeps crumbling, if we are refusing to return to God. Does that make sense? We shouldn't be surprised when, when things continue to fall apart, when we refuse to deal with the singular problem. And that is our relationship with Him. Guys, listen, here's what I've seen. At working in church for a long time now, a lot of people, when, when they come back to church, that meant they've been away from God or they've been out of church or they've allowed stuff to get in their lives and they come back, what I find is they don't really want real change. They just want God to fix one little area of pain, to get a new strategy to deal with things, to alleviate their pain for a minute, to, to go to a counseling session or two, to scrub away the rust, to deal with this habit that's causing difficulty right now. And guys, you might be happy with just a little bit of change in your life, but God has so much more for you. And for me, Here, here's the truth. God has much more for you than you want for yourself. God has so much more for you than you want for yourself, which is why he allows, listen, the locusts of life to wake you up. So again, where is this happening for you? Is this happening in your life? Is there something in your life that God is trying to send you a warning through it. So what does he say? What does God say in this warning? The second thing to look at, what does God desire, right? What does he want? Well, look at Joel chapter two, verses 12 and 13. It says, now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness, and He relents from doing harm. Now listen, the call here, God's desire is for true repentance. And the thing to notice here 
is the kind of repentance that he is calling for. And it's the kind of repentance that grows out of love. I want you to look at the words that describe this repentance here. Turn to me with all your heart, with with fasting and with, with weeping and with mourning. Tear your hearts, right? He says. He's describing a repentance that comes from a broken heart, right? Not just a a bent will, but he's picturing a repentance here that comes from a broken heart, a heart that is broken over what its sin has done to God. And guys, listen, that's the only kind of repentance that works for any length of time is repentance born out of a broken heart. When what bothers me about my sin is some painful circumstance that it caused, or that it made me feel guilty or ashamed, or that I got caught. When, 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 when that is where my motivation is, all of my resolutions to change are going to be short-lived. They're never going to last. But in those areas where my heart has been broken before God over how I've hurt Him and driven His presence right out of my life, when I come to that kind of repentance, when I'm broken over that, it's those things that, that really bring change into my life. The reason some of us cannot repent effectively, because and it's just over and over and over again, is because we don't really deep down love God the way that we should. Notice here he mentions fasting too. And I want you to see for our purposes today that for the Christian, even fasting, is an expression of true longing, right? And love for God. It's real and deep. We don't fast in order to gain some kind of favor with God, but we, but we fast out, out of favor that God has already given us out of love for what He has done for us. God's true repentance, true repentance says, God, I need your power in my life in my family, in in my church, and I'm heartbroken that my sin has put me in a place where I don't have that. God, things aren't okay with me. What I need is not a better marriage. What I need is not some kind of financial fix. I don't don't need you just to, to give me a new job or to take that person out of my life. What I need more than anything else, God, is your presence and your power in in the center of my life. And I'm brokenhearted that it's not there. And I want that more than I want the most basic things in all of life, even the food that I eat. God, that's, that's brokenness, God. When we as a church would say, I'm not okay with the amount of people in our community who don't yet know Jesus. And I'm not okay. It's not okay. The number of families in our church that are splitting up and the injustice that still affects people in our world, in our community. And it's not okay, God, the number of people that have never heard the name of Jesus. And and, and I want that power and that presence in my life and in our church more than I want the most basic things of life, even the food that I eat. God, as a church, we want that oh for a single church that would pray that way, that would fast that way, that would love God that much, that would be that broken over the sin in us. God's presence and power flow through a repentance, listen, that grows out of a love for Him. Not that I got caught, not that it's made my life hard, but that I've broken His heart which causes us to ask the question, how do I learn to love God like that? How do I learn to have those those feelings? How do I fix that in my heart? Well, guys, you begin with His love that has been demonstrated to you by coming for you faithfully again and again and again. Joel here says it himself in verse 13. Let me read it again. He says, so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. Here's why, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Joel simply says, return to God because of who he is. Think about his love. Think about his grace and his mercy. Grasping the love of God for us produces love for God in us. Okay? First John 4.19 says, we love because he first loved us. 
And, and church, we will learn to repent. The way Joel describes here, when we submerge ourselves in the truth of the gospel and the truth of Jesus' love for us. It's why we say around here that the gospel is not just the beginning of the Christian life for us. It is the Christian life for us. Everything in the Christian life, grows out of your knowledge and experience of the love of God expressed for you in Christ Jesus. When we understand that love, then we are broken over our sin. When we destroy that fellowship, we are broken over that. Now let's see what God promises. What will happen if they do return to Him? Several things. Look at verse 14. It says, Who knows? if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So here's what he promises. He says, says, when when you return, he will turn and relent. That's mercy is what that is. And then it says he will leave a blessing. That's grace, mercy and grace. Mercy is withholding us Uh, withholding from us wrath that we do deserve. Grace is pouring out His goodness on us that we do not deserve. Let me give you an illustration. If you break in my house one night and you steal stuff, but I catch you and I don't call the cops, I have given you mercy, right? I am withholding from you trouble that you rightfully deserve. But if I go on from that point and I say, well, you know, for you to have broken in my house like that and to take those things, you must be in a great uh, financial need. And so I turn and I write a check for $5,000 and I hand it to you. Now, I've already given you mercy and now I am giving you what? I'm giving you grace. I am not only withholding from you what you deserve, but I am giving you goodness and privilege that you do not deserve. And this God desires to do for his children that return to him. He not only wants to shield you from his wrath, but he wants to return blessing into your life. Chapter 2 and and verse 19 says exactly that. He'll actually pour out blessings on you. And then if you'll look at chapter 2 and verse 25 with me, this is probably the greatest Now, passage in the whole book, he says, So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. Now, guys, this is restoration. God will go back and make up for what sin has destroyed. Has there ever been another expression of grace like that? This is how much God wants to love and bless us. He will replace restore and make up for what sin has destroyed in our lives. And guys, sometimes you'll experience that on earth right now. God will give it back, set it right, fix the relationship, restore the career, whatever it might be. Other things we we, we may not experience until eternity, right? But he will restore the things that sin has taken. Every time I think about this, I think about Peter. Now think about Peter's great sin, right? In denying Jesus three times. And I think about Jesus' intentional effort on the beach after the resurrection to bring restoration into Peter's life, to restore his purpose, to restore his joy, to restore his heart, to restore his life to him. And Jesus wants to do that to us when we return to him. He wants to restore what sin has destroyed. What is sin destroyed in your life? Say, well, really, Steve, that's a long list. Return to me, says the Lord, and I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. It's not over. Your life's not over. If you return to God, He promises that what you went through will be swallowed up in goodness. What you brought on yourself will be swallowed up in goodness. Now that's worth tuning in today right there. And guys, I realize this is an Old Testament prophecy and it, it was not written directly for me and you right here, right now. It was written for the nation of Israel a long time ago. But I believe the principles of returning to God are true not only then, but they are true now in your life. 
and in my life. So what happened to all that wrath that God had against our sin, right? The hordes of locusts. That's a great question. Throughout the book of Joel, he talks about the coming day of the Lord where God will pour out His judgment on sin. And when we hear the day of the Lord, a lot of times we think about the last days, right? We think about about the end of time. And indeed, there will be a final day of the Lord when the wrath of God will be poured out on sin. And and Joel even says in chapter 2, verse 31 and 32, that in that day the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Now guys, this is where you see the gospel in the book of Joel. Because Paul said that this day that Joel refers to was fulfilled at the cross. In fact, Romans 10, 13 actually quotes Joel. When Jesus died on the cross, the sun was darkened. The locust, if you will, of God's wrath devoured the body of Jesus at the cross. He was the focus of the wrath of God on our behalf. This was indeed the day of the Lord, the day that sin was dealt with once and for all. He took our sin in our place so that nothing but power and blessing and resurrection would remain for us. Paul quotes Joel in Romans 10, and it basically says God has taken wrath so that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The gospel right there in the book of Joel. The first sermon preached after the resurrection, the text of that message was the book of Joel. And the message was very simple. Return to God and He will give you the presence and the power that you need. Guys, the absence of God's presence, the absence of God's power and blessing from our lives or from our church has nothing to do with His unwillingness to give it. It is indeed our sin that is the one thing that is wrong. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 says it, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor His ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. So here's the question for us today. How badly do we want the presence of God? In our lives? In our church? And the answer to that question is that we want it just as seriously as we are willing to take sin and as seriously as we are willing to hunger for God's presence. He says here with all of our hearts, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, with rended broken hearts, we are to return, return to Him. One of the greatest revivals in church history happened in Korea. In the early 20th century, its beginnings always get traced back to one singular event. Back when the Korean church was very small, there weren't many Christians at all in the whole country, maybe only a few hundred believers. It was at a prayer service, and one of the Korean church leaders, whose name was Mr. Kang, he stood up in the meeting, and he was trembling. And he said in in a very quiet voice, he said, I have something to confess. I have for weeks harbored an intense hatred in my heart for Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee was a friend and a missionary that was leading the conference. He said, I confess before God and before you, I repent. Well, the room fell silent. Did this man just publicly admit to hating the leader of the conference? So every eye then turned to Mr. Lee to see how he would respond. Mr. Lee was taken back and he couldn't hide his surprise, but he quickly answered. He said, Mr. Kang, I forgive you. Witnesses said what followed was a poignant sense of mental anguish that fell 
on all of the believers over their own sins. Church members began to confess hidden sins, to weep over them and to pray for forgiveness from others and from the Lord. The meeting that was scheduled to only last a few hours stretched on to five o'clock the next morning. Similar events began to happen all over Korea and it led to a massive outpouring of the Spirit of God. And in one year, 50,000 Koreans came to faith in Christ in a country where before there had only been a few hundred. The local college campus in Pyongyang where this started saw 90% of its students come to faith in Christ. And today, uh, I don't know if you realize it, but South Korea is one of the most missionary sending hubs in all the world. And it went back, say Korean believers, even today, they say it went back to when we began to take sin seriously. And we began to hunger for the presence of God in our lives and in our churches. A similar thing happened a few decades ago in South Texas in a little town called, called Brownwood. And there was a church meeting, and in that meeting there was a young student that stood up. And weeping and trembling, he began to confess uh, a hidden sin that had been in his life, and he did it with, with great sincerity and brokenness. And before long, people all over that auditorium began to share that their own sin and their own brokenness and their, the fact that they had been away from the Lord and they wanted to return to Him. And this began to spread all over South Texas, ultimately making its way all the way to Southwestern Seminary and beyond. And a great revival swept through college campuses and seminary campuses as a result of one student that was broken over his sin and wanted desperately the presence of God in his life. And many things are wrong in our lives right now. To the point where we would even say, what's wrong with me? Many things are wrong in our church, in our community, and in our nation. But in reality, only one thing is wrong. We have fallen away from God. We no longer love and pursue Him. The locusts of life swarm to warn us what is for what is coming if we do not return to Him. How badly do we want the presence of God? We want it as seriously as we are willing to take sin and as seriously as we hunger for God's presence. So I came to you today asking the question, what's wrong with me? Only one thing. And God says, return to me that I might restore all the years that the locust has eaten. We have a loving and a patient and a gracious God who is waiting for us to return to Him. You guys pray with me. Father, we come before you today humbly, And Father, as we read your word, as we study the book of Joel, and we see your people that have been so far away from you, and there were so many things that seemed wrong, and, and yet you led your prophet to remind them that there was only one thing that was wrong, and it was that they were away from you. Father, thank you for these verses in this book that promise that you desire to leave a blessing, that you desire to restore what sin and junk in our lives have taken away. Thank you that you are a gracious and a loving and a forgiving God that we might return to you. So Father, I pray that today that every single one of us would take a step of brokenness. Lord, help us to return to that love for you, to recognize what our sin has done. And Lord, would you break our hearts over the things that break your heart? And that, Father, we would return to you 
speedily that you might forgive and that you might bless. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the time today uh, to, to worship you together. We ask all of these things today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, once again, guys, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you for allowing us into your home. Uh, my prayer is that if you have a response in any way to the message today, that you'll comment, that you'll post there uh, underneath this post, that you'll comment on it. Uh, we'd love for you to let us know that you're here. You can actually text hello, H-E-L-L-O, to 329-7929. That way we'll know that you joined us as a guest today and we can follow up with you. And so, uh, man, it's been so great, again, to uh, be with you at Church at Home. Don't forget, we're back in person at uh, both of our campuses, and we look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Thank you.